amazing how this respiratory stuff can turn a respiratory <laughs> tenors and sopranos into basses. <laughs> Today marks the halfway point on our Lenten journey that we began on Ash Wednesday. Over the past two Sundays, we have discussed choices, and we have discussed finding comfort during life's crises. And through those two lessons, we saw Jesus giving us useful teaching and examples to follow. And this morning brings us a passage that may knock some of us back on our heels, as it did me. I want to talk this morning about patience. Not our patience, God's patience. I can remember a lot of times when I was growing up, my mom or my dad would tell me how much I was trying their patience, or how they were running out of patience with me. And I wonder sometimes in our efforts to understand God's love for us, if we ever wonder if perhaps one day God will run out of patience with us. Now just to be clear, even when my parents told me that their patience was running thin with me, there was no doubt that they still loved me. Today's lectionary passage for the third Sunday in Lent gives us an answer to this question. Does God run out of patience? I'll be reading this morning from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And again, I will be reading from the New Living Translation. Just as a little background information, Jesus once again is still on the road to Jerusalem. And he's been teaching steadily over the past few days in the synagogue. And he's been teaching along the road and along the way. And he's been teaching not only his disciples, but the crowds that came to gather. But when he went to the temple, he once again found himself having a run-in with the Pharisees and the religious authorities. But in each of these situations, there were teaching moments, and that's where we come upon Jesus today. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were making their sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee, Jesus asked? Is that why they suffered? No, not at all. And you too will perish unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam <laughs> fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again, that unless you repent, you too will perish. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give special attention to it. I'll add plenty of fertilizer. And if we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. As we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, I want us to consider a word that has either been forgotten or misunderstood in much of preaching today. And that word is repentance. I know a lot of us here this morning came from a fundamentalist background. And we always think when we hear the word repentance that we're talking about behavior and a whole lot of guilt. But while studying for this sermon, I came to understand that repentance 
the word in Scripture has multiple meanings. Yes, in many instances, it does call us to turn away from a sinful life without Christ and to turn 180 degrees to a new life in Christ that's filled with grace and to have and share a meaning, real, meaningful relationship with God through His Son, Christ Jesus. But I also came to understand that repentance can also mean, as it does in the way that Jesus used it in our passage today, to mean a wholesale change in how we understand something. In other words, it is a reconfiguration of our perspective on reality, and for us as Christians, it's a reorientation of us to God. Yes, our behavior may change, but it's not out of guilt. It's because we've been given a new and divine perspective, a brand new understanding of exactly what is possible with God. It appears from our scripture lesson today that Jesus was actually speaking to believers. He wasn't talking to pagans and heathens and like John the Baptist had been when he came out of the wilderness. He was actually talking to believers. And in speaking to believers about repentance, I believe what Jesus names is repentance that changes us and occurs within us when God meets us and reshapes our understanding. What I also think Jesus wanted us to understand this morning is that there is an urgency in this kind of repentance. He's saying that now, today, is the time to do what needs to be done. Don't put it off. Don't hope it'll go away. Don't worry and think it's going to heal itself. I think basically Jesus is telling us to seize the opportunity of the reality of God's kingdom on earth right here and right now. If we understand repentance from this point of view, then this great parable of Jesus contains a message for us today. I know you were all hoping when you thought there was going to be a message about repentance that you would say, well, we're all saved. We can just go on to sleep now and wake up when the sermon hymn comes. But I believe, as Jesus was talking to believers, that I'm talking to a room full of believers also. And I also believe that there's a great message for believers in this parable. This parable tells us of how God extends his mercy and grace. It tells us about how he provides and meets our needs. How he loves and cares for us. But it also tells us that God has his limits. God is looking to see what we as his children will do with what he has given us. <clears throat> there are those within this world who would reject Jesus and resist the love and mercy of God out of sheer ignorance and hatred. But you know, there are also those who claim the name of Christ and take and take and take, but never think twice about giving anything back or doing anything for God. Their prayers always start with, give me. I want us to look at the parable of the fig tree through the lens of Jeremiah 29, 11. Most of us are familiar with this verse. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So if we think about that verse from Jeremiah, I want us to look at this parable that Jesus used to teach a lesson. When we look at the parable of the fig tree, the first thing we see is the fig tree. The owner of the fig tree had planted it, given it a special place in the garden. He had cared for it, and every year he came by to check on it to make sure 
that it was getting along okay. He came by looking for fruit. And every year when he came by, he was disappointed because there was no fruit to be found. In the same way, God has put us here with a plan. He has put us in a garden. He has put each and every one of us in a very special place in his garden. We've been planted for a purpose, and that purpose is to bear fruit. Now, the owner of the fig tree has been very patient. And every year when he came by looking for fruit, fruit from a tree that he had bought and purchased, nurtured and fertilized and cared for, we're told that he was disappointed. Like this fig tree, God has purchased each and every one of us with his own son's life's blood. He has poured his mercy and his grace and his blessings out on every single person in this room. And with that kind of great investment in us, I think God has the right to expect a return on his investment. He has every right to expect fruit when he comes to the garden. Where God has extended privilege, he expects return. Just like in the parable, the man expected fruit when he came looking for it. He did all that he could do for that tree to help it bear fruit. He planted it in a good place. He gave it a caretaker. He selected just the right spot for it. He watered it. He dressed it. He fertilized it. Absolutely no labor was spared to get this fig tree to bear figs. So this man had every right to expect to come to his garden and find figs on that tree. God has the right to expect fruit in our lives too. He did not call us to sit on the sidelines and let other people bear fruit. God made us. <clears throat> he has put us in a good place. He has poured his blessings out upon us like fertilizer, and he has worked with each of us over all the years of our lives. God has spared no labor on us, and he has done everything possible to make us become what he would have us to be. Just as God expects the fruit of repentance from the unsaved, God expects the fruit of discipleship from his Christians. God wants to see the fruit of the Spirit that we see in Galatians 5 in his churches today. He wants to see love and joy and peace. He wants to see patience. He wants to see kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And many of his churches out there are bearing fruit but many of them aren't. It seems that when the owner of the tree came searching for fruit, what he found was only a tree with leaves. What's interesting, and Dan's our botanist here, he could probably tell us more about this, but what's interesting is that when a tree bears fruit, that's good for everybody around. When it bears leaves only, that's only good for the tree. The fruit is good for everybody who comes to that tree. The leaves, they only help the tree. Many of us have leaves in our lives that are sapping our strength and preventing us from bearing fruit. Some of us have the leaves of apathy. Some of us have the leaves of self-centeredness. Some of us have the leaves of laziness. And some of us have the leaves of pride. <coughs> Any scientist can tell you that when a tree puts too much energy into its leaves, there's no energy left to produce fruit. <coughs> Throughout the New Testament, we hear that trees that do not bear fruit end up having their limbs pruned and cast into the fire <coughs> so that the other limbs that are there are able to bear fruit. I know 